Hello, welcome to Hot Pot. I'm your host, Joni Poon, stirring the pot on Asian BIPOC mental health and wellness. Got it. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Trina. So excited to have you here. Um, thank you for coming on. Um, and yeah, as part of this, part, as this podcast grows and I'm diving more into this, I'm really inspired to just interview, or not interview, actually have conversations with different people so that they can share their stories, how they've discovered their parts of their authentic selves because I we've met each other a long long time ago it seems like another lifetime um, lifetimes ago yes. yes lifetimes ago and that's when you were doing very very different things working for a pharmaceutical company um I mean your life story is amazing and the big shifts and changes you've done now uh, yeah maybe I'll let you start and share <laughs> and yeah I know it's um when people ask you what's your story it's like what version do I share? I guess it depends on the audience. Uh, so I think, yeah, Joni, thank you for introducing, like for having me on this podcast. And it's going to be a new form of introducing myself because I've, um, to be honest with you, I'm still working through my own Asian heritage, my roots, my culture, because being first generation, it's, you feel so, it's, you're unraveled and then it's up to you, your responsibility, pull it back together again and figure that out if you choose. And I'm still in that process. So this has been an invitation for me as well to start thinking about my, my wants and my passion. And even if, if there's a craving of going back to the roots, going back to, yeah, true self, it's like part of your authenticity. Yeah. So, so I'm, well, my, I guess I'm going to start with my parents. My, my parents have been through a crazy amount of, of just, ah, I don't even know where to start, but they were both people. They were both from Vietnam. My dad was someone in government. So he was then targeted by the communist party as someone that they need to re-educate, we'll call it. So then my dad went into a re-education camp, which he thought was going to be uh, a week which turned out to be a few years oh and um he it was just traumatizing i i think we should all go and share our parents stories too so we don't lose lose yeah. this this like the stories of like uh the beauty of how we've made it to where we are right because mm -hmm. how many thousands of people uh did not make it uh from the boat people so it, it still breaks my heart to this day uh, so yes, they were boat people and then they traveled to, well, they, they took the first country that would accept them and they, it was Winnipeg. And my parents thought, they looked on a map and they thought, oh, Winnipeg is so close to the US and we have family in the US, we can just walk across. They didn't realize what borders were back then, right? Just um, coming from a small little uh, town close to, close to Saigon or Ho Chi Minh as we know it today. And yeah, they migrated to probably the coldest city coldest big city in the world. I like to claim it, it's colder than Mars sometimes during that deep freeze that we had. And then they had me um, a few years later, I'm a middle child and gosh, growing up, I grew up in the middle of a kind of like very suburban um, and no one looked like me growing up at all. And it was, I, I I guess that was my first time of just having an identity sort of crisis without even realizing is, oh, you know, nothing, no, none of my friends look like me, but my parents look like me and we speak a different language. And then also I was like tossed into French immersion. And so I had three languages jumbling up in my head at all times and um, had my first sense of trauma that I, I still carry to this day where I think that I'm not communicating well. And all, yeah, all my friends will tell me, oh, but you speak so well, you're so eloquent. And like in my head, it's, are you hearing the, are the words coming out straight and clear for you? You know, so I am um, just growing up, even having different languages has created this sense of just like, uh, am I, do I even sound like I'm, I'm communicating well? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. yeah, you get it. Yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing that because it reminded me because I'm, 
I feel I'm first generation as well. Um, and it's just so interesting how you mentioned it's like, oh yeah, because well, we, we moved around a lot growing up. Um, mm. And then when we did move to Canada, we were in Alberta and I remember going to school and like you, I was like, no one looks like me. I was the only Asian in the whole entire school. Yeah. I felt so out of place and not welcome. I think it's mean. So it was traumatizing too. And 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 the speaking part, like there was a lot of shame in and even because we spoke Chinese at home and that's what we did. Mm-hmm. I was in Hong Kong for a bit. And so that was my mother language. I mean, when I get angry, I default to that still now. Oh, geez. <laughs> super frustrated there's certain words that just like it's, and the thing is like there's I, I still carry a little bit of that like am I speaking well enough or am I slurring or I don't have an accent or or I feel a little sense of shame so for me that's reclaiming my language and finding the beauty in it because I remember at school they're like oh you know Joni's English is not good um mm-hmm. to ESL and then I went to ESL and then after that it's like yeah no and they were actually encouraging my parents to con- think of like ways to help me so that my parents almost considered like maybe we should we should stop teaching her Chinese or stop encouraging that and I'm glad my parents didn't but you know like imagine what if that happened I would have lost that that piece of me which I I sometimes default to when I'm emotional yeah. and it's just like I do carry a little bit of that shame sometimes because when I go back to Asia the weird thing is I also don't fit there anymore mm-hmm. <laughs> right oh, something different about you and I'm like oh <laughs> great now that that's my identity crisis because then where do I fit in right yeah. and um it wasn't even it wasn't even me realizing wait I'm different it was not until I, my brother is about eight years younger than me. Mm-hmm. And I asked him one time when he was younger, he was like maybe in grade five, you know, it's like, you know, at that time, you know, you have crushes on girls and girls have crushes on you. So I asked like, oh, you know, does any girl like you? Or do you like any girls? And this still sticks to my head to, the, to this day is he told me, Trina, girls don't like boys with black hair. Oh. And then like, okay, I'm still, I'm still tearing, still tearing, because I, I just realized this boy who's so innocent realizes this. So like someone's told him this, or he's been shown this somehow. And I thought, and then just kind of all like the wave came over me. Like, yeah, I had so many, did I have a normal childhood growing up? Because I had so many crushes on boys, right? And they all had their girlfriends and everything. And I was always the one that just was left alone. I felt very alone because I didn't have that like ever, oh my gosh, see I'm tearing. Um, didn't have the, the the same experience growing up as as the other kids. So it was just, it's like, hey, um, all right, that's part of my identity now, you know, and, and I'm embracing the, di- the difference and diversity. It was a different way to grow up, but it was also to stay, whoa, that, okay, this is, this is what's made me me. And also it's, gave me another superpower, which is like, I will literally just uh, stand in a crowd and not feel awkward at all. Cause I'm so used to being the outsider that they're like, oh, who is this person who's just like, comes in to these like creeps, like, you know, like camouflages in and just like, it just feels so comfortable in her own skin, just being in any circle. Like, cause I, I had to work through that fear to now become the courageous, weirdo that I am just standing in circles <laughs> any like going in any group at all and I'm like I'll feel completely comfortable because yeah that's because I'm so used to being that that um someone who's different yeah I love that I love how you turn that life experience that that trauma into I'm also turning up a little bit into <laughs> superpower because like as you said that and mentioned that I'm like all right yeah that's right because I remember kids would be pulling on my hair and they're like you're different and I'm like, thank you. <laughs> like, you don't know until other people tell you that, right? And it's just, yeah, it's just like a lot, especially when you're so young and cognitively, you're just not aware of what's going on, the complexities of like different emotions and layers, and and of course, parents, yeah. my parents being Asian, they don't really talk about emotions a lot, and and of course, oh, yeah. and of course, they they love us and and it's just, but at the same time I also realize now looking back they don't know how because 
they spent all their life in Hong Kong amongst other Asians. So diversity wasn't like a, a lot there I, as well. So they didn't know how to deal with being different. So they didn't have the tools to, they're just like, oh, they're just kids who don't know better. You're, you're loved. And they would say that, but then other than that, they don't really know how to go beyond that just because they've never experienced them themselves, right? And and like you, I developed a superpower where I can drop into spaces and be more empathetic <laughs> and realize when other people, like I can feel when someone's uncomfortable and out of place and I just yeah. want to make them feel comfortable because I know what that's like. Yeah, yeah. So but yeah, thanks again. It's uh, it's it's nice to feel seen. Like, wait, this isn't only, and of course it's not. But it's just I've never had this type of conversation where, hey, no, I've 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 gone through this too. So thanks for opening up this space once again. And whoever's watching and listening is like, I'm pretty sure I'll be like, wait, yeah, I've been through that too. <laughs> oh, that's why I'm so passionate about this podcast and and the way we're I'm we're doing it is just to invite our listeners to join in as if they're part of the conversation yeah mm -hmm. and talk about it amongst your friends and yeah thank you for sharing your stories Trina I'm wondering are there things that you've done in your life that really helped propelled you to discovering more of yourself and more of those authentic pieces or even you talking about reclaiming your culture or yeah looking more yeah yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of, I guess there's you going through the stages of acceptance. There's always the, it's almost like stages of grief, right? There's all those stages and um, acceptance is the last one. But so the first ones, first ones are denial. And so I spent a lot of my, my years just denying my, my culture. And also it wasn't that difficult because you're just washed in the, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so I, I spent most of my 20s probably just not um, not looking into anything. And it wasn't until my my 30s that I decided, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna visit Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back and check it out. And I um, I guess I had my my hesitations, of course. It's like, oh, you know, it's gonna I, I had a like of course a bias to what it's gonna be like. And, Oh, there'll be like village people and you know xyz but like oh, i don't even know there's such bad stereotypes i had in my head and then i went back and it was they were the warmest they were some of the warmest people i've ever met and they really cared for you and i understood community and i felt as if there was community even when they didn't even know who i was it was just this there's a sense of just like everyone takes care of each other especially when you go into the smaller smaller villages and how I I don't even know how to really go and like share very much about it other than I feel like it I it started it seeded that that like hey there's there's something about eastern culture collectivism if you want to call it that that I really I, I want to bring back to my western culture which is we really do prize the individual and like I, and, and it's weird. It's, I grew up uh, with my parents. And um, so there's like a golden mean, like Aristotle talks about the golden mean. And there's like, okay, so if you talk about collectivism or like, we'll call it Eastern culture, we'll just, you know, just shove it in that box. There's the, there's a collectivism where you take care of everyone else and everyone takes care of you. But then there's like the super other side of it, which is you take care of everyone and no one takes care of you. And it feels like I was, I didn't learn to have a voice and I don't know whether it's due to my upbringing or just maybe just the way I was raised or sorry, just the way I like my genetics or how I am. But I really did go on to the other side, which is I didn't know what I wanted because I, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted. And then I gave everything I had to everyone else, which turns into this like, you know, manifests into resentment and anger at the world. And then, so there is something about Western culture where you, it's about, hey, who are you? Figuring out who you are, what you offer and what you want. And then sharing that with your family, your friends. So I'm, it's, there's this, I hope I'm like making this succinct, but the Eastern culture is beautiful because everyone takes, 
in the in the most uh, cultivated way, everyone takes care of each other and everyone gets their needs met. And in Western societies, everyone is um, gets to bloom in their own specific way and also will get their needs met. Mm-hmm. And there feel I feel like there's this, but where I feel like I grew up in a way where I just took kind of the the bad parts. And then I then try to in, add in the Western part to finally just get me to well, like what, like create an algorithm in myself, which is, so before it was someone, like let's say someone asked me like, hey, do you want to go for a boba? And then the first thought was, oh, they want to go for boba with me. Oh, how do I make it work for them? And now it's, do I want to go for boba? Like, I, I forget to ask myself that, like, do I want to go for boba? And then it's, um, oh, I don't, okay, what do I want? But I, st- I want to go maybe for a tea. Mm-hmm. And then it's saying, oh, I don't want boba, but I want tea because then you, you, you finally have a sense of just agency and power first. It's like, oh wait, I want this. Let me share that with this other person. And then we can figure out what we want to do together. Cause really they're probably not wanting boba. They just want to connect, mm-hmm. right? So it's, um, gosh, it's like such a complex um, uh, like way of thinking that I've been really working through, but yeah. I really do feel like this is like um, the, I don't, I don't even want to call it the bad parts, but like the, non, the non-cultivated parts of Eastern culture and how you're raised is about following authority and just, and making sure everything, everything is like, you know, fits right and no one gets angry. And I, but like the beautiful part about Eastern culture is that once again, it's about everyone being taken care of and everyone takes care of each other. But what you need to know what you want first to be taken care of, because otherwise everyone's going to just keep giving you something that you don't want because you never had a voice to share like, hey, I actually don't want this or I want this. That's so interesting. Am I agreeing? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting how you phrase it that way, because like my my personal experience with the Eastern culture and the collectivism, I mean, it's very lovely. It's all about, you know, looking after each other, yet there's an extra layer is looking after each other or your elders at, while you need to, not need to, but it's almost an unspoken thing where it's like, you sacrifice to look Mm. after each other. You sacrifice your own wants and desires and needs and who you are because it's not really about you as the, like the Western culture singular individual you. It's it's about us, the family, you know, the tribe or the community you're in, right? So how are how do you carry yourself? How do other people see you, right? Like, are you dishonoring the family? Are you dishonoring, right? And then then it's like, okay, how are you looking after your elders? And if even if it's not something you really want to do, it is your role and responsibility, because they yeah. have, now it's your turn. So then a lot of times for me, the struggle, like with your boba example, it's like, let's go for a boba because someone else said that. And then I've been caught whatever someone else says, especially in a position of power, because oftentimes Mm -hmm. with collectivism, there's also that hierarchical, like respect your elders. Yes. So then when someone in a position of power said something, I'm like, oh, okay. I don't even second guess or think or consider, right? And then, and, and then as I, you know, through through living in a Western culture and through really learning what it is to, what, who Joni is, like through therapy actually in different modalities, I discovered it's like, oh, oftentimes I do things, um, especially people in power to please them so that I will mm-hmm. be like valued, so that I am part of that tribe, right? That collectivism. Um, so that I'm accepted and then I don't even know what I really really want because if you ask me like oftentimes I'm really confused and then when I do feel into it there's a sense of guilt and shame it's like am I allowed to have it or is it wrong right so (laughs) someone asked me like in position of power do you want boba I'm like yes do I really I don't know do I even really I mean I do (laughs) but I'm like oh but I don't really want it this way and everyone does it that way and that's what how my Mm -hmm. right and then just so complex, like you said. Right? Yeah, and I'm, I, I think we're, we're working through something that like we're, like I love this, it's totally off the cuff and we haven't like planned any of this, right? And it's just like, let's develop this, 
thing that like we're both feeling afflicted by and we don't we haven't figured it out yet and actually i when you said a position of power and authority like of course it's my parents it's my grandparents and i would say yeah like our that's our like um our obedient yes but then what if we have accidentally labeled everyone as authority because it feels like as a child you've you've been, like taken in the your how you do everything in the world like right um i forgot who said it but give me a child at age seven and i'll show you what kind of man or woman they'll become in the world so at age seven i was still like ah yeah everything so everyone was my authority i didn't have anyone to boss them on for sure as a, as a seven-year-old so then now i've seen every like every single time i hear a command it's just like yes because it's just so natural for me to just say I will serve you and I want to, um, yeah, like I will, yes, I will, I will be obedient to you. And maybe that's, that's what it is, is um, that's something that I'm working through for sure. And because of this Western culture that we're in, it's just definitely created this clash about there's people out there who are saying no and still being respected. It's like, yes. what's happening? It doesn't work, it doesn't compute. So I, that's what I'm working through is, wait a second, I, we all, I wish we create a culture of community where we all take care of each other. But to do that, we have to take care of the individual first, right? A microcosm is a macrocosm. Mm -hmm. So how do I then serve myself? And of course, with the, with always the lens of serving others, but it always has to start with from within, because if I stay repressed, it's going to bubble out somehow and then be a disservice to the community. Yeah. So that I've created this new framework of like, how do I know what self needs, Trina needs first? Uh, and still, yeah, like, of course, I want everyone to be taken care of, but I see the consequences of not serving self first. So that's that's why. Me too, I have seen that. I've seen it even in my own parents, like my father, like he's the most quiet, typical Asian quiet, spoken, mm -hmm. doesn't say much when he does, then you know it's something serious. and. <laughs> And the thing is like over the years, he's very patient, very quiet. And I've noticed the buildup of resentment and not caring for self. And over the years, you know, I noticed his health is declining. I also noticed like he will snap to certain triggers. And I'm mm -hmm. like, this is different. But then I guess that's what will happen when you have all these expectations put on you and you start suppressing, you're like always wanting to be the obedient son because he, he was that he was always praised and even my grandma's like your, your dad's like really good he put himself through school got scholarship I was working most of the time he, he even like because in Hong Kong they weren't really rich so they lived in a very small unit and there weren't separate rooms and so when he would study he would study inside the bathroom with the light on so that he wouldn't disturb oh gosh and so that obedience even when uh, we all immigrated to Canada and my grandparents came same thing I could see that I could see my grandma says do this and then my dad will go above and beyond to make sure she's all taken care of and it's almost expected mm -hmm. to the point where there's no like oh thank you it's like you do this mm -hmm. or else you're a bad son and I've seen her say that too <laughs> right Boy, so... and then now when she does says something that's not very kind I can and, and or not true I notice my dad will react now and mm. say things or this is bubbling up now or it's just like, like or there here's the family systems work that's i've been learning and discovering those patterns it's like don't tell your grandma this because i get really like let's say my parents want to go away and they're like okay don't tell your grandma this that we're gone because what my grandma used to do or still does actually um is that if she discovered that they're leaving she would just feign being sick or she needs to go to the emergency. So then, then my parents won't be able to sleep or they have to delay their trip or something. Mm -hmm. And that creates a lot of anxiety. And of course, them being the, you know, obedient filial, Lyle uh, child, um, some words I still can't say properly. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they would do it, you know, out of concern, even though it's been a pattern. I noticed my grandma does that quite a bit. And so is she really sick or she's using that? right, for attention to make sure that her son doesn't leave her and that make sure that the son's mm -hmm. still taking care of her. And, and so I was like, wow, there's all these complexities. And then my parents then wonder, because when I'm afraid to tell them things, I start hiding or don't tell them. And then they're like, but we want you to tell us things. We want to support you. And uh, like, oh my gosh, I'm 
did from you guys. That's what you guys did do to grandma, <laughs> right? And that's why we don't tell you things. And yet you want us to tell you things. It's like, there's a little bit of misalignment there. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's so it's, gosh, the complexities. And we could talk about the Oedipus complex that is very rampant in our culture. I, like it's, it's definitely in my family. Uh, where like, the Oedipus complex is just the mother over mothering the child so that they take away the power of the, well, usually the son, so that the son and the mother have this like enmeshment together, which, oh yeah, it's just, it's rampant. Uh, but it's, so I'm seeing like, the, it's about, I think what we need in all cultures and communities is everyone has a sense of agency. Everyone realizes their sense of power and even hearing the story between your your grandma and your parents, it's there's so many ways um, if we create space mm. to communicate and just share. Like in the end, it's hey, we love you and we do want to spend time with you, but we we want to do this one experience together. Is is like is that okay? You know, like earlier on in the relationship, maybe that would have worked, but now at this stage, it's just maybe like way 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 too hard. But it's about it's. Yeah, it's creating that space about um, giving everyone agency and saying, hey, this is what I would like. And of course, our parents want us to have what we want. Like we, deep down, it's there. So it's about like, you know, I like back to like, hey, I, I don't want boba right now, but I love you and I want to see you. And that, that gives like that space of like, oh, okay, I don't feel rejected. Let's go do something else together. Or I go boba and you go have some ice cream. Mm -hmm. you no, know, so I, I think it's just about there's a loss of personal power when it comes to these hierarchies and these like um like respecting our ancestors, which I don't think they realize they don't want that either. Mm -hmm. They want because when it gets to 20, 30, 40 years later down the line, it does turn into yeah, the um the typical like, yeah, my dad also is very quiet, very obedient and things bubble up for him too. And then it turns, it's like either quiet or angry. There's, there's no room for anything else. Yeah. So there's, it, it's this, um, well, I guess we're creating an invitation. It's just like, wait, is this some pattern that I see in my family? Mm -hmm. And if so, maybe it's my responsibility if I choose to take it is to reclaim my authority, author, like write your own story, claim my own authorship of myself and start sharing like hey this is what I want but communicate in a way like I love you it's always I love you I respect you but also let me have my own life because we are not supposed to be living the parents the lives that our parents lived right um I would hope that they want better things for themselves and if they want better things for themselves then it's not redoing the same patterns that they've lived because of course that's what Einstein says like insanity is doing the same thing over and over again it's like you're going to be repeating the same pattern they're doing they live the same life they're having. So it's about giving the parents giving space to their children to be like, okay, I'll trust you to do something different than what I did in my life. Right. And that's hard. And, and like those patterns, I think that's where the real work bega begins. Because oftentimes if you look, and that's why they call it intergenerational or ancestral trauma is because they've never been taught to trust. So they can't even trust themselves. How can they trust the yeah. child? Right? Yeah. My parents lived a very traumatized life. Like my mom, there was 11 kids. So she wasn't raised by her parents. Same here. Right? Same here. My, my, my mom's family had 11 kids. Well, 12. One yeah. Yeah. I, I don't even know. But well, that's, and this is also amazing. Like, how do they have 11 kids? Like I had one and I almost died. So like, they had a hundred percent more than I had. And like, I don't, I'm not going to go through that again. But anyway, um, there's, where are we where are we getting at but um do you mind if I ask you because it's been on the back of my in my mind I'm, I'm just yeah. curious how have you like what allowed you or what really helped you to really start looking within and and feeling yourself up first or, or looking taking care of yourself because you mentioned that and I was like oh that's so important because we see it in our parents we see it in our dads right like it's either super quiet yeah not so long that suppressed feeling it's anger now so yeah like how did you discover that oh it is important and stepping away from those you know asian cultural patterns that hey i need to look after myself and it's not about 
you over the other person, but by looking after yourself and honoring that, you're also loving the other person because you can be yeah. with them too, right? How, how did you, yeah. what allowed for that shift? It's, I, it's, I mean, when you're in, you're in the pattern and you're in the cycle, it's, it's so hard to step outside, but you, I mean, the, the answer is I hit, I hit rock bottom. Like I had the, who I thought was the love of my life break up with me on the phone, uh, who was my fiance and uh, my job and everything was suffering. And so it's, uh, I did yoga teacher training. I just remember my philosophy teacher saying like change and shifts happen when you're at rock bottom. And I, I wish it weren't the case, but I do see, yeah, of course it's like, okay, I can't handle this anymore. Something's got to give. So yeah, I, I did hit my, my absolute rock bottom. And I, I went into lots of addictions. I was drinking almost a bottle of wine every night and um, starting to do harder drugs, which are very ego, egocentric drugs. And, um, and then it was a friend who just said, well, why don't you, you know, you're at rock bottom, why don't you start meditating? And I thought, is that really going to help? And I thought, okay, well, what's, what's, you know, 30 minutes twice a day. Okay. And then I said like, okay, I'm going to promise me to do 30 minutes twice a day for 30 days straight. Cause I know it takes 21 days for neurons to rewire yeah. together habits. It's like, okay, I'm going to do that. 30 days go by. It's like, I feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do 60 days. Mm -hmm. And then I did 60 days mm -hmm. and I just had this, um, I think my friend actually, she described it as she gave her a sense of secure attachment. And I definitely didn't have secure attachment. I'm very, I'm either anxious or I'm, I'm avoided. Like I, I switched between two of them and I, I like, I felt a sense of just like, yeah, agency within with just starting this meditation. And then I also had this just like, oh, like what's wrong with the world? I didn't want kids before. I was like, you know, we're just overpopulating everything. And then I went to Burning Man, <laughs> which um, everyone should just Google and just see for themselves what it is. It's just one of these incredible communities that get built up in the middle of a desert and everyone shares their gifts with everyone else. It's an example of an actualized community, in my opinion. And I regained a sense of humanity and faith in humanity. It's like, oh, people are, people are kind. People want you to have good things and have a good time. Like, I forgot that. And so I regained a sense of like community purpose and love for my fellow brothers and sisters again. And I, that's when I, I took a long pause from uh, psychedelics. We'll talk a little bit about that, but um, I was reintroduced to psilocybin or as we know as magic mushrooms. And oh, that just like, it, it like, just like everything finally just landed. Like the meditation gave me lessons. Bernie Man gave me lessons. And then the psychedelics, mushrooms like psilocybin just like it just added clarity this like that i gave me a new vantage point of seeing everything instead of being in it the patterns and just continually just jumping around in my own patterns it's like whoa wait i'm doing all these things i could see the way my family work i can see how i work within my family i can see how i work within my friends all of these systems how i how i'm managing at work so it was it, it was psilocybin that uh, was like it was the integration work it was the, that was the magic key, magic mushroom key for me. What is, um, so did you find that you were meditating, you noticed a difference and, it, and through psilocybin, it really brought it to another level that you were almost able to see it from like a top down view, or I like to call it from my personal experience. It's almost like it really allowed me to embody everything that I was cognitively aware of. Like for me, meditation, I struggled with it for the longest time. Uh, and I was like, I'm not driving into it, but I'm trying. <laughs> like I'm still, and I'm like, I guess I feel a little bit better. And then, and then it wasn't until I experienced like, you know, uh, psilocybin that I was like, oh, it's not just thinking about it. It's, it's really embodying and feeling it. Yeah, I, I yeah, I call it, it's like experiential learning. I, I've like, after Vipassana, which is this 10 day silent meditation, um, it's the style that the Buddha taught meditation, uh, taught by the Theravada monks. Okay, like, so that's my intro to Vipassana. And they, that's why I finally understood, because I've done 
I did I did all the thing that I, I was the obedient child, just like a little bit of background is like I did I did pharmacy. Everyone wanted you to be a pharmacist as a Vietnamese daughter or like a doctor or a farm a pharmacist. Oh, and I became both. <laughs> now I'm a doctor in pharmacy. So I'm like, oh, I did everything they wanted me to do. I, and I that's where I was like, oh, knowledge, 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 like just keep learning, reading, reading. Uh, the, um, so after doing the the passion of meditation and sitting there and doing the same cycles and over and over again and feeling my body, the the lessons are like being carried through in my body. So it's it it just dawned on me like experiential learning. That is how you actually learn. That's that's like wisdom because there's this like there's the oh I'm gonna do this thing because I learned it and then there's the I'm gonna just trust my instincts. Mm -hmm. There's no like for me now I don't feel like I think about what I'm gonna do. I just mm -hmm. trust my body and my self to just yeah. be in alignment and just yeah. do as I have already known to do yeah. all of my life that I've done yeah so like like okay I'm, I'm gonna just like really respect and like honor that experiential learning part of me and just then trust yeah. mm -hmm. so I I um it it was yes I agree so, like psilocybin then bringing it back is psilocybin it just it just like integrated it into the body and all the things that I thought I was like okay I gotta memorize this and do all these things I gotta remember the A turns to B turns to T C you know it's just like it just like gave me this like internal wisdom of like oh I can trust myself again mm -hmm. and I it just it just made sense. <laughs> it's just I hard know. to explain. It is hard to explain. I think one one way I can explain uh, from my own personal perspective and from what others have shared with me um it's it's not just only embodying and learning to trust self it's almost like that same sense of like oh my gosh we've actually had this even as we're born we're naturally born with all this we just <laughs> get disconnected from it through life lessons that teach us otherwise right like whether mm. through society, cultural norms uh expectations put on us uh, and it's so interesting, like with the mushrooms, it allows that all to disappear and to really reconnect with you, your, your original like body awareness, like even without overthinking, it's not about cognitive, it's not subconsciously and just deep down your physical body. Like you don't think about, I need to breathe. I need to make sure my heart's, breathing. it just knows. So it's like, it's almost intuitive knowing, like it knows how to rest. It knows how to be still, right? And, and the beautiful thing is I, what I, I it's not just the knowing and trusting in that, but it's almost like as you're seeing all those patterns, it's almost like connecting the dots and then you're feeling it all and you're allowing mm -hmm. yourself to feel it all. Because oftentimes, yeah. like, you know, as we mentioned with our, our fathers, we learn to suppress. So I also learned to suppress <laughs> and that's us numbing and disconnecting and not feeling. But with mushrooms, it allows us to feel it all, good or bad, mm -hmm. just feel and be with it. Yeah, it's yeah. um one more thing is when you were explaining all of that, it's uh the yeah going back to the body. So feeling is healing is what I always say. And there's if I start overthinking things, I realize oh, I'm back in my head again. Let's clear yeah. that away because that's just causing me stress, right? What's that, that quote about if you're always thinking in the past, you're depressed. If you're always thinking in the future, and you're you're anxious. Yeah. Like I was just thinking with myself like, well, is my what's my narrator doing right now? It's like most of the time it actually doesn't have, it's not really going on anymore. It's just, mm -hmm. I feel like, oh, you know, the sun's nice. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't communicate with me anymore. It's just present. It's just mm -hmm. like uh, going back to body and feeling. And so I, I like to, that's a good, that's the way I check in with myself mm -hmm. is like, if I'm washing the dishes, is it like chatter, chatter, chatter? Or it's just like, you know, this like presence of like, Hey, you know, I'm washing the dishes. It's a, it's a, like um, it's a ritual. Like just like yeah. hey, let's ritualize everything. That's going into another another session. But it's just I I'm really yeah, the it's brought me back to present too. Like mm -hmm. not just psilocybin now, because as you know, I've worked with lots of different other medicines, traditional earth medicines, and they've all had their part in mm -hmm. giving me a new sense of awareness mm -hmm. and um. Uh, and even my like I'm gonna throw out like all these things I've done it's like oh well I've had a baby in the last like, year that's and a big that was, one uh, it's one of the biggest like um gifts I can have and 
I'm so glad that I have been doing a lot of self work so that mm -hmm. she's she definitely passed the the stranger test the um, attachment test just recently and um, yeah I've done I mean meditation is one of those just key and it doesn't have to be sit down and just like focus on your breath or it's it's about every moment in life is a meditation it's I'm eating a blueberry and instead of just mindlessly eating it it's about like oh wait a second like oh it's round and what does yeah. it taste like when you first take that bite how juicy is it is it like slightly tart is it sweet it's about just being present in every moment instead of being taken away into all these other possibilities that actually probably won't happen and why am I like calculating all these possibilities when I need to just continue to remember like I trust myself I trust all of my wisdom that I've had over these last few decades, like it's, mm -hmm. it, let's stop with this busy chatter and kindly say like, oh, you don't need that. Not say stop, but like, oh, you don't need that. Just, just put that aside and just like remember to be present in every moment. Yeah, and I think that's so beautiful. I think it's also important to remember that. I, I found, you know, oftentimes for me, one of my coping, I didn't, I didn't realize this again. That's why it's so important, like through meditation, through, psychedelics and even through like therapy I discovered like oh what am I coping coping mechanisms is keeping busy doing, mm -hmm. doing, doing busy. like so literally as I'm doing dishes I'm like thinking even as I'm sleeping I'm like thinking oh my god I'm not sleeping I'm not resting and I'm like wow there's like I'm so much in my energetically in my headspace not in my heart space I, I realized that and I was like oh this is how I cope this is how I disconnect so I don't have to feel overwhelmed and then there's almost that sense of like I ha it's almost an addiction to it. It's like, I have to feel like that because that's what I'm used to, right? Because mm -hmm. that's, I realized like, oh, my mom's really like that. She likes to keep busy, busy, busy. She likes to do, 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 do. And it's for her to sit still is really, really hard. And I realized, oh my gosh, that's her anxiety. But I've also taken some of it on <laughs> as well. And I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> it's like, how, how do you unlearn that? And, and then when I do, do differently, it's almost like a sense of discomfort because it's not familiar. Right. And then on top of that, there's a sense of guilt. It's like, oh, wait, am I supposed to be doing more so that I can be valued? Right. And there's shame because then that's what she's taught me, too. It's like, oh, no. Like, just to give you an example, I, my partner uh, was so lovely. He didn't have to work today. And then he's like, OK, I'm going to go wash that clean, like vacuum, clean the floors and and mop them and, and do some house stuff. And I'm like, oh, OK, thank you. Actually, you know what? I was going to do that tomorrow. And I was and he's like, no, 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 don't do that. I'm like, do what? It's like. I just offered to do it. And I was like, oh my gosh. For me, I already naturally wanted to be like, oh, maybe I'm not contributing enough to my home or to the home or because I'm so busy working. And, and then right now, I mean, I'm enjoying myself doing this podcast with you. It's just that there's a sense of guilt that I'm like, I need to also help out at home. But I'm like, he's not working. It's not about equality in that sense. I'm like, he's already offering and they're naturally already like, no, 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 I need to do to feel valued. <laughs> Right, and so there's that double edge, and then I'm like, wait, there's that sense of shame and guilt, and I'm like, oh no, because that's what my mom taught me. Because if I didn't help out enough in the house, it's so funny. There's that that feminine um, stereotype too. It's like, oh, I remember uh, when I was growing up. She's like, you're a female. You need to learn how to cook and clean, or else no one will want you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, thanks, mom. I've heard that before. <laughs> oh wow, and just like giving space to that is like you're taking a, you're robbing your partner from doing a act of service for you yeah. which and he's like letting you know like hey I want to do this for you and you're like no 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 and then it's kind of like like no give me my gift back you know like, so, yeah, like, yeah. Hey, it's so nice to just like give space to that and like oh wait he wanted to do this for me or uh -huh. so like, yeah, I don't know and um and I'm just robbing them from it I'm like no it's yeah. mine <laughs> and you really yeah. want it it's just like it's just like like a weird like sense of just like I have to do this because I was programmed that way well, there, there was another edge uh, to the sword too. It's like, oh, but I also want to f make him feel like I, I care and love for him. And by doing that, I want to clean the home. Because <laughs> that's what I was taught that, you know, as a good, you know, female partner, you need to keep the house tidy, right? And I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's not just only f taking it away from him, but also like, I, that's how I want to also show that I, I love him. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> so... You know, it's really interesting and complex. And I love this quote where someone shares like, you know, two, two truths can exist at the same time. It's like yeah. looking at, at a coin and a coin has two sides. 
And it doesn't mean one is true and the other isn't, right? Or false or wrong. It's just that, yeah, you can mm-hmm. feel all the things. And then just realizing uh, they want to do this because they love me too. And then is it yeah. time, is holding space for yourself? Is it time for me to honor that and receive that gift, which is really hard? I'm learning, I'm still learning how to do that. <laughs> or, or, you know, or do I say, hey, I really appreciate that. And thank you. I'm going to create space. I don't have to take on this extra stuff because I'm already doing more enough, like more than enough. Yeah. 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 We're always, it's always like, um, Brene Brown says that um, the people who with the most joy are the ones who truly believe everyone's doing the best that they can. Yeah. And I, I am in that, I, I'm happy to say like, I pretty much like feel that way. And if there's ever this narrative saying like, oh, well, they could be doing more. It's like, wait, wait a second, but we, I don't know where they're at in life right now. Do they have a toddler running around everywhere? They literally have no time. Does something happen in their family? What's happening in their career right now? It's just everyone based on like, just got to count into their stress levels, their time, what's going on, their emotional states. Like they are doing the best that they can because I know we all innately want to do, to, to, to do and to be helpful. Yeah. But wait, let me go back to that story about like, um, it's, it's really important that I'm really trying to figure out what is cultural and what is maybe a symptom of our society nowadays. Mm. Because so my partner took me to, I, it was one of my, it was a very beautiful experience. Like I look back at it, like that was beautiful. But in the moment is very uncomfortable. He brought me to a fishing village in Indonesia. Mm. And um, they are, they live the way that we like probably not even my parents, but probably like my grand grandparents lived. It's just like live off of the land. Um, like maybe like a few people went to the, the where the, the busy islands were gilly tea, but like most everyone just like lived off the land, made the food. And when I watched them, it's like literally I was like standing around, like sitting around in their like pagoda shacks, just like, what are we doing here? He's like, just, just like hang out, just watch and see. And like a week goes by, I'm like, I have all these things I want to do. I should be doing all these things, you know? He's like, no, just just hang out. And like I li- literally, I think it took me two weeks to just finally be okay with being, with just yeah. like present and like not thinking about like, I wish you're doing this. I have all this free time. And like, yeah. that, that's how they are is, is hmm. they're truly just like, they just spend time with family. They just, they don't even have to talk. You know, like I used to think my dad, I used to think like, oh dad, maybe you should talk more. You should mm. hang out with more people. But like, I just watched the father just like, just love watching his children explore. And I just thought this is, this is masculine energy. It's just like, they don't have to be talkative. Like something mm. weird in me was like, no, you should be talkative and like make lots of friends. You know, they're, they're just content and just providing this beautiful, container of safety so that their kids can explore and, and they're all- witnessing it. Mm-hmm. They're witnessing it. They're just being present and witnessing and seeing and, and taking it in without having to do. And there's not there's no busy busyness yeah. there. They yeah. you know they might do their laundry, they might cook. They their houses are very simple so you don't have vacuums and all that. It's like and you're pretty much outdoors. Mm-hmm. Like your home is almost outdoors. So it's just we're, we're so busy, but it's just like, wait, our ancestors weren't. And there's a, maybe some symptoms that come out of mixing with Western culture and also just so many things going on. So I'm really trying to break down, like, I want to live, like I got to, I had such a privilege and opportunity to live the way mm-hmm. I feel our ancestors lived a few hundred years ago mm-hmm. with slight modifications like cell phones and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like wow we were we had lots of time but mm. we don't have time in modern culture but yet we have all of the advances like what's going on here so it's just like now I, I get to see like how do I want to live because I got to the both bookends of possibilities it's like mm. oh um how do I not be as busy anymore oh let me just stop having so many complicated things in my life simplicity mm. brings out just like this um yeah a sense of calm yeah. <laughs> so I, I yeah, it's, there's just, I, I do, I hope everyone has this chance to just like go back to like the way we used to live, have this opportunity. Like maybe everyone should just go do a tour on this island, just like, and just like for like two weeks, 
it took me two weeks to just be okay with I believe you. Yeah, I'm the same. And then once I experience it, I'm like, I don't want to come back. <laughs> because I realized how busy and how I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually, that's where some of my anxiety comes from. And I'm like, what? And it, yeah, yeah it's nothing more for people to experience this. But if anything, not because not everyone can just jump and go, is to just like what I'm hearing in your story or in our stories is that really through our own exploration, doing the work through different modalities like meditation or um, psychedelics, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, we, we're we actually noticing those patterns and uh, noticing what it's like to be and, and not do and creating that space for ourselves so that we can choose. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing, I think, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, Trina, thanks for sharing so much of your story. And uh, I feel like I can talk about this with you for hours and hours and hours. And no, like we, it feels like we scratched, like barely scratched the surface. I know, we tried to touch on so many different things, but it just naturally flowed and I really enjoyed it. I would love to definitely have you back. Um, as we are wrapping up, uh, because I'm sure our listeners don't want to sit for five hours and continue this conversation, or maybe they do. Uh, yeah, um, maybe everyone wants to join us for five hours. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, th three questions for you. It's like, one, what would be something that you would like, to, if you were able to travel back in time, like an advice you can give yourself? Hmm. Uh, I'm... If I actually saw me and was like, that's me, oof. And like part of me wants to say, oh, well, I, I, like, I totally love everything that's come from me. And like, I love the path that I'm on right now. But there's this one, okay. There's this one time I offered this beautiful woman a journey, like a psychedelic journey. And she woke up and she looked at me with such clarity. And she said, Trina, you are so powerful. And I, I like had this like sense of like, oh, I don't, I don't like it. You know, it, it, it didn't land. And I had to sit with that for a while. And I thought if I believed I was like, cause now I believe I'm powerful. Like I know I'm powerful, right? Mm -hmm. We're all powerful. Let's just claim our power. It's like, whoa, if I, at a younger age, if I had just finally just stepped into my power. Oh yeah. She said, Trina, you're powerful. It's time to step into your power. Mm -hmm. And I thought, because I, I feel like I'm stepping into my power and I have stepped many steps into power now. It's like, well, if I just stepped into power, knew I was powerful earlier on, it's like I could have actioned on the things I have, I know I have capacity for. So it's about, it's like, Trina, you're powerful. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd say. I love that one. Yeah, so beautiful. And the second question would be, uh, what... Is something that you're looking forward to, to experiencing and trying that you have yet to do. Mm, I'm doing a, um, I'm doing a current experiment and seeing if it works. And I, gosh, there's like more to this, but I, it's, it's talking. Um, I'm obsessed with um, a actualized community. It's like, hey, how do we get back to the way the indigenous people? Taught, a, taught, lived. Like they lived a very, very self actualized, community actualized way of being. Mm. So I want to start planting those seeds. It may not be in my lifetime, but let's start seeing like, can we make this happen where mm. everyone is taken care of and everyone's divine gifts then have an opportunity to be mm. offered to the world? So mm. it's, um, so my, what I'm doing now is everything is by donation and I would like everyone to who's in who like comes to me has everything that they need so like let me go back to what was that what's the what's the like the root of the question again <laughs> the question is like what is something that you're looking forward to or open to trying that you haven't done yet yeah I, it's going to be a lifelong experiment experiment is I'm going to I'm working on trying to see how we can get back to to are offering our divinity to everyone by creating an actualized community. That's what I'm working on right now. Oh, I love that one. Yeah, I love that. Um, I mean, I could 
dive into that as well. It's just, it's so crazy, but that's another podcast. And because I've actually experienced what it's like to, it's almost like a, it's a different lifetime. And I could see myself in that tribe as an indigenous woman. And it's so weird. And, and, and what a beautiful experience, but that's a whole different <laughs> different conversation. So thank you for sharing that because I, I remember being in that community and that support. It was just like unconditional love and support and everyone yeah. respected and honored each other and everyone yeah. had gifts, which was so beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um, and the third question is, I know you have a, a child, so what's something that you would like to impart to her or the future generation? Well, I'm definitely gonna let her know she's powerful. <laughs> Love that. And, uh, yeah, and that um, remember to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's okay. it's it's safe. The world is safe, so remember to play. So oh, that's my, my biggest message for all of us. Like, not even mm-hmm. her; she's playing all the time, which is like reminding me to play. Mm-hmm. But I think I hope we all just, at every age, just like wait a second. Let's not be busy. Let's just let's play. Let's expand our time because mm-hmm. uh, we fill our lives with memories, not with time. That's so true. We we that's how we leave our legacies through memories, right? And and that's how we, I think it's so important because we oftentimes do life and we forget to experience it through play too. And it's so important. It's interesting how you brought that up because lately, um, I think the collective is like saying something because uh, a few people that have supported. And uh, through their psychedelic integration work, they're like, oh, part of it is not just only doing the work and being on my path, but play. Play is part of it. I'm like, yeah. Oh, well, then there we go. The seeds are spreading. Yeah. So Thank glad. you so much, Dana. This has been so lovely. I definitely love to have you back again. Um, it was so very I- fun. Thank you. Thanks.